Uh, okay, so next we have Robert Minchin, who will present to us about the Fifi LS instrument. Let's see if I can share my screen. Okay, do you see my screen? Yes. Excellent. That's the first hurdle I've overcome. I'm going to talk about preparing a Fifi LS observation and hopefully you can see on the screen a slide showing what FFLS looks like mounted on the telescope. So first thing you're going to need is for your source, whatever source you want to look at, you're going to need a flux estimate and your proposal has to include an explanation of how you've got this estimate. And so we look at an example that we want to look at the O3 doubly ionized oxygen 52 micron line which is a very popular line with PPLS because it's one that is often needed to round out Herschel observations. This was outside the Herschel band, but we can cover it with PPLS. So people have got lots of Herschel data on a galaxy in the archive or whatever, will often want to look at this to round out their survey of that galaxy. So there may be pre-existing 88 micron O3 flux measurements from either Sophia or Herschel observations, or if those aren't available, we could make an estimate using the far infrared continuum or some other measure, as long as we say what the me method is we've used to start that, to make that estimate, and we put that in the proposal so that the reviewers can look at that and see, is this a sensible way of estimating the O3 flux? So I'm going to take an example here from the Herschel Dwarf Galaxy Survey of Markarian 153. So Cormier et al. measured uh, 88 micron flux of 98.9 over a 3 by 3 spa spaxel area. Spaxel is a spatial pixel and Pax had these, Fifi had these. It refers to the 5 by 5 array of the sky. Uh, to distinguish it from the pixels on the sensor which are form the whole cube and there's 400 of those. So when we talk about spaxels we're talking about the spatial pixel that is actually on the sky. And you can see from the map that Cormier et al published this is a compact object and so we can calculate the flux that we expect to see within the central spaxel. We're going to take that 88 micron as a lower bound on the flux of 52 micron and at 52 microns, we expect the flux in the central spaxel with PPLS to be about 55%. And so that gives us 5.4 times 10 to the minus 17 watts per meter squared. So we can take that and bring it into sight. As we mentioned in the questions just a few minutes ago, the other thing we need in sight is the redshift. It's because the different line will fall into a different atmospheric band at uh, and also slightly different instrument sensitivity response as you move to different velocities, different redshifts. So we'll take that from there to 2389 kilometers per second. And we'll just calculate the time estimate at the standard site values of signal to noise ratio of five, 41,000 feet, and a default elevation of 40 degrees for the telescope. Red bring up sight. And this is the front window you get when you come to site. And you can see my cursor, you click through onto Fifi LS. And we come down here. So we want to change the wavelength to 51.815, the rest frequency for the O3 line. We're going to change this so that we get the total integration time needed to reach the S signal to noise ratio of 5. Going to make our source flux. Let me just click back and see what that was. 5.44 times 10 to the minus 70. And we're going to make our source velocity 2389. And now we hit, we have the 40 degree elevation, we have 41,000 feet, and in fact the water vapor is set by the altitude. If you change the altitude, the water vapor changes with it. That's just following the default. And we hit calculate. And 
So this is going to be in fact observed at a wavelength of 52.228 microns. And we expect an integration time of basically 36 minutes. If we scroll down and have a look at our atmospheric transmission, that is about as beautiful an atmospheric transition as you could possibly ask for. Really a very nice velocity range. So beautiful atmosphere, 36 minutes on source to reach five sigma. So we're going to go and we're going to put these values into U spot. And we're going to need to fill out the items with red stars. Other items can be left for phase two. So bring up U spot. And on the when you open U spot, you start on the proposal window where you would enter your title, enter your team. These stars here mean you have to look at this, not necessarily have to tick it, obviously. But what we're going to look at today is we're going to go through to the observations tab. So click on observations at the bottom here. And at the moment, there's nothing here. So we need to start by adding an AOR to this. So there's a new AOR, create AOR button up here. When we click that, we get please select new observation. Now, uh, various different observations available for the six science instruments. There's two different sorts of observation available for FIFLS, what we call the AOTs, Astronomical Observation Templates. There's the standard FIFLS, and new for this cycle is the FIFLS on the fly mapping. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the on the fly mapping today. I'm going to go and look at one of the standard modes because that's what we're expecting to use almost all the time. We'll click on this, and it pops it up on the other window, so I'll have to drag it across. That's good of it. So we get this AOR here, and with all sorts of things, three columns. First thing we're going to do is go and specify a target. So we click on New Target, and that window pops up. And we're going to look at Martharian 153B3. And if we just hit resolve the name, it fills these bits in for us. And that's great, we have our target. Hi, Robert, this is Ariel. Uh, do you think it's possible to make your window bigger? Window bigger? Hard to, the um, AOR. AOR. Is that no it just it doesn't change the font size that's fixed yeah but it makes it easier on webex uh, for some reason but is thanks that, for doing that is that easy to see for me yes easier yeah okay thanks i appreciate it right um so we have our target mark area 153 well that that doesn't fill in the source velocity so before we forget we're finished defining the target by putting 2389 into the source velocity field. The rest wavelength, we have two of them in the blue here and in the red here. So we're going to, in the blue, change this to the 03 line, 51.815. The width of the spectrum, we can actually leave that as zero. This becomes important if your spectrum is going to be wider than the instantaneous width of PPLS, uh, and this it isn't. This is just going to be a simple line, so we don't expect it to be very broad. You can check in the observer's manual what the instantaneous velocity width that you instantaneous bandwidth that you cover with PPLS is, and if you're going to need to cover more than that because you've got a very broad line, then you might want to put something in there. But for now, we can just leave that as zero. We'll leave the red looking at the C2 line. So we set the source velocity. Uh, for 52 micron, we're actually going to want to use the 130 micron dichroic. That gives more sensitivity at 52 microns than the 105 does. Uh, we don't technically have to set that now, but we may as well. On source time per cycle is 30 seconds. We want to leave that as it is. So we said we want 36 minutes. So at 36 seconds a cycle, that's going to take 72 cycles to get there. 
and we're not using multiple short AORs. That's if you have lots of different AORs that can be used to not get dominated by the fixed overhead, which is applied to each AOR, but for most observations, that should be set to false. We're not going to set any mapping at this point uh, in phase two or just before the observations are made, put on the plane potentially. We will set up a dither, but we don't need to set that at all at this point. So we'll just leave that as one point and it'll be a lot simpler. Over here, the instrument mode, we have three main options that we're talking about, spectral scanners and engineering mode, symmetric chop, asymmetric chop, and total power. So symmetric chop is the standard mode, and this puts uh, both nod cycles have a position on the source, and so you get symmetric chop positions each side of the source, and you nod uh, to point on each side of the source and chop between the source position and the position that's off the source. The asymmetric chop does a chop on the source and then nods to somewhere completely different and does a chop off the source, which obviously takes more time, or more overhead time for each cycle. The total power will do unchopped observations and has a long nod off the source. This you So this one, you, asymmetric chop, you would use if you couldn't fit a symmetric chop in, but you could fit in a single chop position. Total power you would use if you're in the middle of a dense cloud, for instance, and you can't fit in any chop position at all. And that's not going to be the case here. It obviously comes with uh, some sacrifice in terms of how good a subtraction you're making because you're not making that quick chop. So we'll stick with symmetric chop and we'll go down here and we'll check the observing observation estimate. What it tells us is the exposure time is 30 seconds per cycle times one map position by 72 cycles, which is 2,160 seconds, which is 36 minutes. Then we have the overhead calculation giving us a total duration of 5,772 minutes. Okay, I'm going to hit OK on this. That will light that AOR. You can now see in this observation request we have that here. So if we go back to here, we find we have 36 minutes, 72 cycles. Here's this total time, which you just saw, 1.6 hours. And as I said, we're going to want symmetric chop. We're going to observe the target in both knob positions. And now we want to put up a visualization to make sure that those top positions are going to be clear of the galaxy. We're not going to be, sometimes if it's a big galaxy, you can only chop in certain directions or you have to chop you know, by a certain amount. Obviously, if you're looking at a source inside our galaxy, this becomes even more critical. So if we go back to you spots. 10 minutes, Robert. You. And we'll go images. We're going to grab the DSS image. That brings up a window that looks like this. Whoops. And we'll just take the standard survey. The standard size should be OK. And we're just going to bring this down. This then creates this frame here and automatically switches to it. Let's make this window bigger again. And this button here is draw current AOR footprint on image. To do that, we can see we have our actual observation here and the symmetric chop is shown north and south. Uh, what we're actually defining in this AOR, which is the default for FIFI, is horizon chopping, which means the telescope chops parallel to the horizon rather than in a certain direction of the sky. If you've got blank fields all around, this is more efficient. But if there's other galaxies if nearby, or if you say have an extended galaxy, which uh, you were looking at the disk and you wanted to avoid chopping onto elsewhere on the disk, you obviously wouldn't want 
the old horizon chop you want to chop in J2000, which is in sky coordinates. Now over here, we can click on this rainbow tab to bring up the controls for the background. And we can change uh, the percentages or we could say, that actually well, that makes, a, makes it look horrible, doesn't it? Let's make that slightly less. There's obviously a bit of a gradient across the sky on here. But as you can see, we're not seeing anything that looks like another galaxy coming up. You know, right at that point it goes, but there's no other galaxies that look like that the same redshift. Obviously, you've got some background galaxies like this one over here, but that looks like a high redshift spiral that's not going to get in the way of our observation. So I think we are probably absolutely fine with this one. So we'll go back to slides. And the other question we might want to ask is, are we going to see the C2? So Herschel did see the C2, had a flux of just over 50, times 10 to the minus 18 watts per meter squared. Uh, again, this looks compact. I haven't put the picture up this time. And so we have a calculation here of 40% of that flux will be in the central spank cell. This gives us 2.124 times 10 to the minus 17. We'll go back to site and get my mouse to come. So we can change this to 2.124. Change this to the C2 frequency. Uh, the rest of it stays the same. We're still no, it's not. We want the signal to noise ratio and the total integration time of 2160, I think it was. He said 36 times 60. Let's double check for that. Oh, didn't write that bit down. Yes, 2160. And so we can hit calculate on this. And so this is telling us we haven't got such a nice atmosphere this time, but it's okay. Uh, and we're going to only though reach a signal to noise of about four, this looks like. So will we see it? It's a bit dubious. We expect a four sigma detection, but we actually have another catch on this. When site gives you the answer, it gives you the answer for the best dichroic for the position which you're looking at, which for the 52 micron is the D130 dichroic, but for the uh, C2 line is the D105 dichroic. So if we look at the Cycle 9 handbook, we see that that actually decreases our sensitivity at uh, the C2 line by a reasonable factor. So in fact, we're only going to get a two and a half signal detection of C2 in that central pixel. So it's Pretty dubious that we're actually going to be able to see that. But possibly summed across the entire field, we will see something there. But obviously this isn't important for the science and you want to make it clear in your case and in the feasibility section that you know this, that the C2 is not likely to be detected because, and that that's not a problem for your science because you've got the C2 from the Herschel observations. And so you won't be marked down then for not having that detection. Okay, so any questions? Thank you, Robert. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat yet, but feel free folks to put them in there or unmute yourself. We have a few minutes to take care of any questions. And uh, this picture I'm showing on the bottom here is, by the way, the M51 CCLS data in the software Sospects that Dario Fada wrote for 
uh, Sophia Spectral Explorer. And so that's a really good tool to actually look at your CCLS data. And it will also look at great data and measure data. Once you've got it. We have a question uh, uh, from Yao Lun Yang. Uh, is the information about dichroic options available in the handbook? So that this uh, slide that I showed here, this is actually from the Cycle 9 handbook. This figure is in there. You can see how the 105 and 130 compare from the different sensitivity curves in the handbook, yes. The main place where it comes up is 52 micron line. You can see the 130 goes, the 105 goes up and the 130 comes down. So in this area, we use that dichroic. And of course, anywhere in this area here, if you want to look at a blue line in this area, you're going to have to use the 130 dichroic. And so it's normally driven by which dichroic you're using in the blue. The red is always better in the 105. And so that's something to bear in mind when you're using, specifying which one your science line is, is the driver for which dichroic you're going to select. Uh, 